I'm probably called the most bearish guy in the freight market because I'm just talking about the sort of bearish story that exists in freight. But I, I'm also looking at it in terms of the optimism we have as Americans, just looking at it strictly from a, a supply chain standpoint. We have everything we need to live. We have we produce 30% more food than we consume. We have so much energy supply and we're finding new pockets of energy and new ways to exploit energy. So we are blessed with such great geography and resources. And we have this vibrant economy that's built on innovation and entrepreneurship. You can't help but be excited about it. And that's why I, I am incredibly bullish on what's going to take place in the next decade. And you have to, I mean, the, the American flag says it all. I mean, we, we should be proud to be Americans simply because we, we are delivering economic prosperity across the world, but also to our own people. And we are in charge of our own destiny, which I think is what makes it super exciting. You basically, amidst, I would say, criticism and skepticism from your industry, I have a note that people even got to a point where they were saying that you were responsible for setting trucking rates, called a massive freight recession, and you were spot on. So question one is, what were you seeing at the time that proved to be true? And, and was it more true than you thought? Like Now that you've seen it play out, what actually happened to what you thought would happen? Yeah, it's actually nice of you to say that people were, uh, uh, disagree with us because it was actually a lot of vitriol. So uh, the conspiracy was that we had decided to put this, this publication out about a freight recession, and we were the ones manipulating the market and ultimately causing the crash, which I think is incredibly interesting for an $800 billion market, as fragmented as the trucking market is, that someone could actually think I have the power to do it. I wish I had that kind of power, but I don't. So when we look at what we saw back in 2022, so Freightways tracks what we call high frequency data, which is uh, really uh, uh, message flows or orders between companies that ship things, uh, companies like a Walmart or an Amazon or a Best Buy and P&G, et cetera, and trucking companies that service those companies. And so we look at the message flows, the volume of transactions that go uh, between the shippers and carers community. Uh, and out of that, we draw conclusions about the market. And we see basically the physical goods economy. So we're tracking approximately 80 to 85% of the physical, what we call containerized goods, which are things that are you know sold largely to consumers, but also includes parts of the industrial uh, uh, system. Uh, it includes uh, things that go into housing, auto, et cetera. And through that data, we're able to sort of see the pulse of the, uh, not only the U.S. economy, but the global economy. We saw a pretty severe downturn in goods shipments. The number of shipments that uh, were going across the, the goods economy uh, started in, really started in last uh, January 2022, but really picked up steam in March of 20, 2000, uh, 2022. And that's when we identified that there was a freight recession that we believe was imminent. And it turned out to be correct. Um, Bloomberg actually ended up in an article about six weeks after that, after the, this was March of 2022, six weeks later, Walmart, Best Buy, Amazon came out and said, wait, we have too much inventory. And if you remember in mid-year last year, there was a conversation about they have too much inventory. And what we were seeing in the freight data was that there was a slowdown in volume of shipments, but we didn't know exactly what was causing it. We suspected it was an inventory overhang. We weren't sure. And now, you know, when they came out with these reports, they were basically validating what we were seeing in the freight data. Bloomberg actually coined it the freight waves recession, which I don't know if being having a recession named after you is a, a compliment or a curse. Uh, but uh, I, I guess it's a badge of honor of sorts. Uh, and so, um, but we saw it in the data. And that's what we do is we track global supply chain. We look at the goods economy on a near real time basis. And we see what's moving, what's not moving, and we draw conclusions from that. Okay, um, we're 18 months uh, later. What are you seeing right now? Uh, and I, I'll, I'll quote you on something. You said, one of the great things about freight data is how broad and fragmented the market is, along with the fact that supply chains are upstream. Our trucking and container data sets come from completely independent sources. So when you see a development in both container and trucking data sets, it suggests that something macro is happening. 
That is what I am seeing in container and trucking. Year-over-year volume comps in both data sets, both inflected in recent months, suggesting that inventories have burned off and the goods economy recovery may be on the way. Yeah, so this has been one of the darkest and deepest freight recessions in history. So just to put this in context, the last major freight recession was 2019. Uh, It was the largest number of bankruptcies that happened in the trucking industry since the Great Recession. This is actually far greater and far uh, more damaging uh, and and longer than that freight recession has been. This is often, as the industry industry professionals would say, compared to the 2007, 2008 great financial crisis. It feels like that. And some have argued that it's worse. And the reason that they believe it's worse is that um, the, 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 t- the, the length of which it's taking and the fact that prior to the time that the freight economy entered a recession, this time around, we added so much capacity. So it's just an overserved market. And we have way too many trucks relative to the amount of freight. We also have way too many warehouses and airplanes and ships and all all this capacity that's been built up is just overbuilt versus demand. And so we have to put that in context to understand that when we're talking about volumes, which is what most macroeconomists are concerned about, they don't really care at the end of the day, the number of trucks. They don't really care about the number of warehouses. What they care about is what's the broader economic story from a macro basis I don't really care how many trucks are in the market. I care about what the goods economy look like. And what's really interesting about it is if you took the COVID extremes, the 2020, sort of Q4, 2020, uh, and Q and all of 21, and you remove those from the data sets, uh, 2023 would actually be a very strong freight economy. Now, I say that saying that this is also a great freight recession, and it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. but what I'm actually saying is that from a freight market participant standpoint, it feels really, really tough. But from a broader macroeconomic standpoint, it actually is uh, not that difficult. In fact, the market has held up pretty well. What we're seeing today, though, in the freight data, and I, I tweeted that, I believe, two weeks ago, where we're seeing a rebound in container movement and a increase in inflection in trucking data that suggests that the freight market, the goods economy is starting to re-accelerate. So certainly there have been parts of the economy that have been in a recessionary activity, even outside of freight. You know, housing, you could argue, has been in a recession for some period of time. Auto did not not experience that, but other parts of the good economy did. And it looks like from what we can see and what we're saying is that a lot of those sort of rolling recessions that everybody likes to describe them as is largely over with. And the goods part of the economy, the demand, manufacturing, industrial uh, and consumer consumption is largely reaccelerating which I think is a, a really bullish thing for 2000. OK, and, and based on historical patterns, once you see that trend start, it's never like a blip on the radar. It's like, oop, false positive. We're we're going to tank again. Like usually based on how these things play out, once you see that reversal, you kind of have clear sight that things are starting to pick up. Well, when so we take in data from a lot of different sources. Um, modes of traffic is a term of our industry, which means a mode of traffic is a ship, is a, is a railroad, is a truck. It's a mode of traffic. And what we're seeing it is across all modes, this is rail, this is truck, and this is ocean container, and air freight, might I add, all of the modes are saying the very same thing, which is the goods economy demand is reaccelerating. Now, what we believe happened is that, because if you look at consumer consumption data, consumers have not slowed down a ton. There's been some softness and pockets of softness. And, you know, throughout the last 24 months, we've seen certain categories um, have sort of unusual, even food categories have had unusual consumer slowdown, uh, which is not easy to explain. A lot of people have struggled to explain why certain categories uh, have been impacted by consumers. But when you sort of boil it back and you sort of understand that um, when you when you look at the fact that we had so much inventory coming into 2022, 
is that every major big box retailer and 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 really every retailer uh, and manufacturers for that, really everybody in the economy had dealt with this sort of whiplash of not having products and inventory uh, and raw materials uh, in supply during the COVID economy, that they overreacted. And this is a what they call a bullwhip uh, scenario. Uh, it's the classic bullwhip effect that's sort of taught in academic classes in supply chain, which is the concept that companies tend to overcorrect, is they get the signal of demand and they overcorrect. And that's what happened during the COVID economy was we had a combination of, of fiscal and monetary stimulus that was driving a ton of demand, and you had inventory shortages throughout the supply chain. So everybody, all these upstream suppliers, and you may have hundreds of upstream suppliers in a supply chain, are all ordering more to make sure they don't run out. And it, it's taken us at least a year to burn off, and maybe 18 months, you could argue, to burn off all that inventory. And what we're saying is we believe that that inventory has largely been burned off. And the economy's basically reset back to sort of a pre-COVID cycle. It's taken a lot of time, long time to get there. And what we're seeing now is a more normalized pattern, uh, from what we can tell, uh, that the economy's operating sort of the way it would operate in a pre-COVID environment. And so that's encouraging from a freight standpoint, because that means that um, inventory and demand cycles will be far more predictable. And now it's just a question of how long does it take to burn off the excess trucking capacity and warehouse capacity and OSHA capacity, which is an industry-specific problem. Yep. And real quick, b- before we go on that thread, there was another uh, quote you said or somebody said on Twitter, but it was like, the problem is that most recession indicators focus on rate of change and ignore absolute levels. To ex- Can you just expand on that a little bit? Like, what does that actually mean? Well, I, I think what... You know, I didn't write that, so it's not. I my think own it was words, somebody but else, I, but you did retweet it. I think what the the author is interpreting is that ultimately, the way economic data works and really business business financial performance works is we're always comparing to a previous period, and and I think from the perspective of a recession, by definition, it's funny because the White House. Uh, and actually, the National Bureau of Economists changed the definition of a recession last year <laughs> because we actually had two quarters of <laughs> of economic contraction, and they were like, "No, that doesn't count. Like, it should count, but it didn't under the Biden administration and sort of ec- economic theory." And look, if we sort of take a, a very loose term of it, you could argue that we had so much excess during the COVID economy that, of course. You had to come down. You had this, you know, sugar high that we were dealing with during COVID, which was exaggerating these uh, sort of the economic data and exaggerating demand. And of course, we're going to come down from that. There's no way to sort of grow and say, you know, one point, I think one quarter was like 18 percent year over year growth and then try to do another compound of that would have been pretty extreme. And so. I think that's what the author was, was saying, is that ultimately a recession, if you sort of looked in the classic definition of it, is two quarters of economic contraction. But it's hard to state that when you had a COVID economy that was sort of goosed up by all of this artificial spending. All right. You said um, we have a lot of excess capacity, usually during what we I'd call like a time of crisis, which was COVID, where supply chains were obliterated and people were scrambling to figure out how to move goods around um, the world. I guess my first question is, are supply chains better now than they were pre-COVID? Like, did we learn how to be more efficient? And if that's the case, is that an argument that some of this capacity could take longer to fill up because we're just operating more efficiently than we were pre-COVID? I don't think we've learned a whole lot. <laughs> like the word supply chain is now everyone's cognizant of it, but they're tired of hearing about it. And I think if you look at, you know, we work with some of the world's major manufacturers and retailers or customers of ours. And what I would observe is there has been some level of attention and budgetary focus uh, and sort of political momentum inside of a corporation for the supply chain managers have gotten more budget allocated to them. They've gotten more resources allocated to them. But those, in many ways, feel like one-time gains uh, from what I observe. They won a lot of sort of 
short-term gains, but now it feels like we're back to where we were before, which is now supply chains are an afterthought. It's all fixed and we don't have to worry about it. I, I, I can't, the word fixed and broken to a lay person really means that when they order something, it, it arrives. And in that, if that is your definition of broken and fixed is when you order something, you know when it's going to show up and it arrives, I think largely with the exception of a couple of small categories and specific industry issues, that is largely like fixed, you could say. We don't have those uh, issues. Um, there are certain exceptions. Pharmaceuticals, a great example of that, where certain categories of drugs because of, you know, Ozempic and the GLP-1 uh, drugs have, have have their own set of supply chain issues that are caused by consumer demand. I would argue that that is a normal like you had those issues and you had those issues prior to COVID, but that is not caused by sort of this extreme uh, supply chain challenges. Um, but you always have issues and you're always going to have things that are quote unquote broken. That's what supply chains, that's the reason my business exists is because the world's always fixing these problems that exist and supply chains are always being disrupted. If that did not happen, I would not have a business. And, but in the, the terms of how a consumer would see it or just the general definition, the answer is largely most of it's fixed. And we're not going to experience a 2021-like issue anytime soon. Well, I have to ask you, now that you said the word Ozempic, do you guys have any data that freight volumes had slowed down at Walmart, Amazon, the big grocers at the same time that America's getting skinnier on Ozempic? We have seen a slowdown in big box. We, we I should say, ha- saw a slowdown in big box retailers and in certain food categories, really in the first quarter and in the second quarter of this year, um, even in the third quarter. But it's it is it would be an exaggeration for me to say that that's the GLP ones or the Ozempic effect. Um, what I do think has happened is a lot of the uh, you know we think about the COVID level stimulus where you look at the amount of money, a lot of those programs continued to, to exist really until this year. And it was actually SNAP payments that uh, ended in April. And you can actually look at like Costco's data and Tyson Foods came out, I believe it was Cargill came out and talked about a, a deterioration in their sales uh, that sh- I think Kraft was also a company. So we saw a lot of food companies that were sort of caught off guard by a deterioration in consumer consumption that happened around the April timeframe, around the first and second quarter reports uh, that caught them off guard. A lot of that was related to government stimulus that was rolling off. And we still had the employee retention credit uh, that finally went away in the summer. I believe it's, you could still qualify for it, but for the most part, the amount of money that the government is funding to ERC programs has, has largely rolled off. And so we've seen levels of government stimulus that it continues as the economy. I do think the Ozempic story is interesting from a long-term standpoint. Um, I listened to a great podcast. The Outlast podcast did had an investor talk about the impact and pharmaceutical impact of what the Ozempic economy looks like. It's a fascinating story. Maybe in 10 years, we look at 2 to 3% less consumption of calories, I think is what people have said across the US economy. Will that make a difference at the margin? Absolutely. But you know, the freight market, this stuff is going to be incredibly gradual. Um, it's not going to happen all at once. And, um, and so it, it will play out, but I don't see anything in the data that's saying people have stopped buying calories. Um, and so it, we do see slowdowns, but I, I, I would be hard pressed to point it to a Zimpic. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you kind of really got me, I, I went and watched the episode we did 18 months ago, and this was a topic that you excited me in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm going to go back to China now. Um, and, 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 and we'll tie it back to our supply chains getting better. So at the time I was just kind of asking you like, is onshoring real? Are we really going to depend on China? What's China's role in all this now, fast forward 18 months. I'll just start with like, what's the latest with China? Uh, his, their, their great dictator came a couple weeks ago, said he was going to get along with us. We cleaned out San Francisco for him. We rolled out the red carpet. And he gave this great, like, honeydew speech that all was good. What's, what's, what's data show you? So, Chris, one of the great things about 
what I get to do in terms of supply chains is we often see uh, the, the geopolitical story play out months or quarters or even years before it sort of becomes a public awareness um, because supply chains are the, the goods economy. It's the main street economy. And so we go back to that episode I did. I believe it would have been April of 2022 when we did that episode, only because we talked about the freight recession that was right after that. So, you know, what's interesting was at that moment in time, the concept of French shoring or the concept of North American reshoring was not in the public consciousness at that point. No one was really accepted the fact that we were going to see this manufacturing renaissance or uh, the China story was still playing out at that moment in time where people believed that China was largely eclipsing the United States, that it was inevitable. And that was a conversation that only folks really involved in really deep geopolitical corners, maybe deep finance and in supply chains were really having, which was the China story while still existing is changing. It's pivoting from this aggressively uh, incredible growth story to this country that was starting to really show its age. And I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a middle age or late stage empire that has largely exhausted all of its ability to compete with the West and compete specifically with America. And that is exactly what we see right now is that China has, through really reckless policies uh, driven by its own self-protection, combined with sort of really poor economic policies and lack of freedom uh, and lack of innovation has put itself in a really big quandary as it relates to global manufacturing and global supply chains. I mean, what she did last, and this after this took place actually after our, our episode, was she shut down the entire country, did a secondary lockdown uh, in the second quarter of last year that, you know, basically locked the entire country down. He thought, the country was largely in some level of lockdown and rolling lockdowns throughout the COVID. When we were sort of coming back on, our lockdowns were short-lived. For a lot of people that listen to your podcast, they may have felt like it was too long. But relative to uh, what happened in China, our lockdowns are relatively short-lived and frankly not that uh, enforced. And we look at what China did was they completely locked down their country. But what they did was they sent a loud, clear message to decision makers in America and in the West that they were going to put their own ideology ahead of their economic interest. And that was sort of put everybody on notice because for years, supply chain professionals and organizations and decision makers did not accept the fact that China would do something in its own self-interest that was not economically driven. In other words, they would never do anything to hurt a supply chain and manufacturing sector because doing so would hurt their economic uh, viability and competitiveness. And for years, that's how they operated, is they, they were willing to make concessions in the export market so products being exported, they were willing to make concessions that they wouldn't make for their own people and even in many ways shape their own policies to, to really enable manufacturers to export goods because they needed American U.S. dollars and other currencies to flow in so they could buy things like energy and, and food. That is no longer the case. And what they have done is they put every supply chain decision maker on notice that their ideology is going to supersede their economic and manufacturing uh, well-being. And so because of that, we're now looking at practically every supply chain decision maker around the world thinking about where do I go to manufacture my products, have dependable government uh, policies that are going to allow me to build these products and have consistent uh, availability of these products, where can I relocate my factories? Where can I relocate my production? And it's obvious that you're going to go to the largest economy in the world, the United States, and you have to consider how is it serving that economy. And that's where the North American reshoring story is, is, a, is playing out. And we're seeing that. I mean, what's incredible about this is um, this is a, an opportunity to see the reshaping of an economy and we're living right in the middle of it. This is a this is a, a completely 
generational shift on how the global economy is going to work. And I think, you know, I am 44 years old. I, Chris, how old are you? I'm 36. So you're, you're younger than I am. Um, and so you lived in a post-Cold War world. You probably came of age where you didn't know the Berlin Wall was largely... By the time you sort of aware of what this thing even existed, it was beyond it. I was old enough to remember it. And I remember, I wasn't old enough to really comprehend what was happening in the post-Cold War, or at the time that the Berlin Wall fell. But like, it's a pretty profound time to go from a generation where you had these big blocks of countries that were effectively at war, like a Cold War with one another, and were had completely different economic systems and ideological systems, but were major world powers and in many ways balanced the way that the world worked to none of that, to having one superpower and these sort of emergence of these sort of secondary powers that arise. And now we're on that sort of a different generation of it. And I think it's hard to sort of comprehend that COVID changed everything. And what COVID did is it put everybody on notice. Supply chain decision makers recognize that having single source products in China was a problem, but it was always a problem for another decade. It was a problem that I didn't have to deal with. Even when Donald Trump put his tariffs uh, in effect, most people ignored that as a tax. They just looked at it and said, this is nothing more than a, you know, a very loud and some would say obnoxious president making his point. But at the end of the day, it's not going to really matter. It's just noise. And that didn't move the needle in terms of reshoring. But what has moved the needle in terms of reshoring is China's inept ability to manage its own, uh, and maybe Maybe it's not their ineptness. Maybe it's their actual effectiveness of trying to control their own people. And as a byproduct of that, saying parts of our uh, supply, you know, manufacturing economy, we just don't care about. And, uh, and now we're in a whole new generation. And I think it's a pretty profound time to be an American because we're going to live through another American century that's going to be the best century that we've ever had. This is why you started jacking me up on the last episode. We started. It's amazing, <laughs> man. Look, look at the economic. It's weird because like I'm probably called the most bearish guy in the freight market because I'm just talking about the sort of bearish story that exists in freight. But I, I'm also looking at it in terms of the optimism we have as Americans, just looking at it strictly from a, a supply chain standpoint. like. We have everything we need to live. We have we produce 30% more food than we consume. And yet we still pay farmers not to produce food. I mean, if we actually decided we wanted to produce as much food as we could, we, we could literally feed the entire world. Uh, we produce more. We have so much energy supply and we're finding new pockets of energy and new ways to exploit energy. Uh, and I'm not talking about alternative energy. I'm talking about petrochemicals. and fossil fuels. And so we are blessed with such great geography and resources. And we have this vibrant economy that's built on innovation and entrepreneurship. You can't help but be excited about it. And that's why I, I am incredibly bullish on what's going to take place in the next decade. And you have to, I mean, the, the American flag says it all. I mean, we, we should be proud to be Americans simply because we we are delivering economic prosperity across the world, but also to our own people. And we are in charge of our own destiny, which I think is what makes it super exciting. Oh, man. I just want to go run through a wall again. Um, and like, I, like I, I can be critical of every, you know, there's a lot of things that we do wrong. Sure. Like, there's a lot of problems in America, but like, you have to be super jazzed and fortunate to live. And this isn't like, like we are just so fortunate and i think that's what we have to remember is like for all the problems we've got we have so much right and so many opportunities anything that humans are involved will have issues that, that come with it um despite all the good and this is all a function of capitalism and we've built the greatest system to reward the innovators and that's what china has effectively gotten wrong is you know it had a form or has a form of capitalism but it also has a form of capitalism that you can do so well so that you don't gain so much wealth that you could overpower or threaten the local governments and stuff. And really, our economy is different because the, the folks that have the power are the ones that create the wealth. I mean, ultimately, that's the way our system works. And so you're rewarded by uh, essentially wealth creation. And it's not selfish wealth creation. It's wealth creation begets exponential wealth creation throughout our economy. 
okay, if I said today, is there a data point or data points that come to mind that would prove that this reshoring renaissance is underway? Do you have something that's to say, look, in the last 18 months, X, Y, and Z has already happened, and I expect this to continue to grow? Yeah, I mean, we've seen in terms of production of new manufacturing, and here's the thing to, to keep in mind is that manufacturing is, and supply chains is not a short-term issue. Like, it is not a fact that I can move a supply chain and build a factory and build manufacturing within a year and see it in the data. This is a decades-long uh, uh, development. But what we're seeing is the number of new manufacturing and production facilities and investment into our economy is growing by something like 10x over the last two years or three years, pre-COVID to now. And what's happening is we're seeing the early manifestations of new uh, production here in the United States as, as companies are now considering unlike before, the United States is a competitive place to manufacture. But it's not just the U.S. It's our, it's our friends to the South in Mexico and Latin America. The Americas are also going to win. The biggest, if the biggest winner of the post-Cold War days was China, going from a backwater to an economic superpower, uh, then the biggest winner in this generation will be Mexico. Like the United States will win. But relative to, to sort of who's going to, to really exponentially grow, Mexico, particularly the northern part of the country, is going to be a primary beneficiary of economic growth as companies move production away from China and Asia. They're going to locate a lot of that manufacturing in northern Mexico and even central Mexico. And that's going to create a lot of, of really interesting opportunities. One of the data points we look at in specific in data is we look at market share of truck volume by origin location. And trucks, as we think of it, is North America, but specific into the United States. So port of entry of like Laredo, Texas, is pre-COVID was the largest port of entry. It lost it when we saw it is historically competed with like the port of LA and Long Beach. Um, and what's happened is the port of LA and Long Beach uh, during COVID had beat out Laredo, and now we've seen Laredo come back. And Laredo, in terms of market share, has has tripled in terms of the amount of truck traffic that's going through the port of Laredo uh, compared to any other uh, in, in itself. It's tripled the, the amount of volume and the amount of market share it has, uh, and has been the fastest growing market uh, in terms of U.S. truck traffic. The other, by the way, the other two cities that I think is really interesting that have also grown market share is Houston, Texas. And that is really petrochemical related as much as anything, uh, but it's also related to a port, but largely petrochemical. Uh, and then Detroit, which is a function of the auto manufacturers um, really rethinking about how they produce cars and moving towards EVs and sort of newer advanced uh, uh, automotive technology. Uh, but that uh, the auto sector uh, has, has done largely well in the last two years, um, much better than other parts of the manufacturing economy. Okay, I want to ask a few questions, uh, just a little more nuanced on different parts of our supply chain. I'd start with uh, with Panama. Somebody asked, drought in the Panama Canal has uh, and traffic is severely impacted. Are you seeing that? Of course. Um, th you know, there are ships now that are routing around uh, down South America, all the way south, you know, um, south of Argentina, just to avoid the Panama Canal. We're seeing them go around. Look, these are situational. And dealing with supply chains and having done it for years is there's always something that's being disrupted. You know, the Suez Canal blockage that happened two years ago would have been a non-story and nobody would have known about it or very few people would have cared had the supply chain not been so, quote unquote, broken at that point in time. But we remembered it because it was the story of, oh, my God, one of the world's largest shipping channels blocked. It was only blocked for like two weeks. And it certainly snarled traffic, but it is a non-consequential thing. If the Panama Canal drought was happening two years ago, every single news 
uh, story would be about it because it would be, you know, it would be a bigger story. But the fact is that this is a circumstantial problem. Uh, it is a challenge, but there are alternative ways to move traffic. So if you're coming from Asia and you're going up the East Coast, you could very well uh, move that traffic through alternative sources. You could reroute traffic to the West Coast and through rail. So these things do happen, and it's a regular occurrence in my world to have something disruptive. But this is a short-term problem that is is going to resolve itself. Canadian Pacific and Kansas City Southern officially merge. How does that basically impact the rail line from Canada to Mexico? It's again that NAFTA, and I know we're we're not call it NAFTA anymore, UNSCA or something. <laughs> I can't. I, you just, I can't. It doesn't have the cold name like NAFTA, but UMCSA. Um, but the NAFTA story. This is what this is all about. Is that essentially, if you think about linking Mexico, Kansas City Southern was that north-south traffic. And when you link Mexico to the United States, to to Canada, they're playing on that north-south traffic. They're playing on the the NAFTA story that really started when I was in college. I went to school at Baylor in in Waco, Texas. And, you know, the NAFTA story was a big, uh, was a big thing, right? Like this was a time in the 90s when everybody thought that Mexico was going to rise as the next superpower. And then China entered the WTO and sort of took that story away from Mexico, the momentum away from Mexico. We're back to that. And what I think this is, is as one of the major rail lines in America, freight railroads in the Americas, has is, is essentially trying to create a, a, a continuous stream on a single owner from inland Mexico all the way to uh, to Canada. And I think it's it's an exciting time. It's just, it's just a function of the fact that we have the best freight infrastructure in the world. And when you start to think about Canada products, which is really raw materials, I mean, that's what Canadians are good at is producing raw materials. Um, they do have good advanced manufacturing, particularly in auto, but they're really, they're, their real gift to supply chains is in that raw material exploitation and production. Uh, and you have the Mexicans, which have relatively cheap labor and plenty of it you know, to produce products. And then you have the Americas, which are, you know, the United States, which is really just the, the consumer economy and the distribution center. So you unite those things and all of a sudden we have a much more vibrant economy. Like the next, like I said, the next hundred years is going to be Americas to have. And here's what's cool about it is look at what Europe's doing is they, they have shot themselves in the foot because of lack of energy. And we, and look, you can give the Biden administration a lot of heat. And I have said this is their energy policy coming into their administration was flawed. Biden said he wants to shut down the fossil fuel industry, but you got to give them a little bit of credit. And I, 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 I'll say, I'll this let you do is, it. <laughs> I, I'll say this. And I know I'm probably gonna get some hate, mail of this, <laughs> but over the last, call it 18 to 24 months, as inflation rose, they have really backed off a lot of their anti-fossil fuel uh, messaging. And it really was a messaging problem. Yes, they didn't permit, uh, approve permits. And yes, they put some regulatory issues in it. But really, a lot of their problem was messaging uh, on how they message to the public and message to investors about fossil fuel exploitation. But what they've realized, I think, is, or at least have not attacked the fossil fuel industry, is that domestic production is the most environmental, it's the best for our economy, and they have far more control of uh, how those, uh, uh, gives them a lot more control of our own destiny and policy. And I, I think you can, in many ways, thank Putin for that as well. Like, the fact that, that the Biden's administration is so concerned about Russia's uh, aggression and what's happening in Europe, that they're willing to sort of allow to step off their environmental uh, and zero carbon initiatives, I think is a, is, is a really big positive for American production. I mean, look at how much oil we're producing in America versus what we were pre-COVID. It's, it's pretty astounding. Yep. All right, we'll give him a we'll give him a, a check mark there. <laughs> I'm maybe the only guest that you ever had that gave him a little bit of shout out. And look, at the end of the day, they deserve a lot of heat for a lot of their policies. And and if you know, depends on what happens in the next election. Hopefully, this doesn't change. Hopefully, this orientation towards pro fracking, pro uh, pro energy, uh, domestic sources continues to stay. Um, it the best thing that could happen if the government just ignored it. 
like let the politicians do the politician thing and just ignore this industry, I think we'd all be better off for it. Yeah, I had a CEO of Di- or president of Diamond back on last week, and I just said, why do y'all do such a bad job marketing yourselves uh, in general? And he just said, we have one of the only products in the world that we don't have to market. The The market doesn't care if they're buying shell barrel of oil, a diamond back barrel of oil. He's like, there is no marketing in our, in our, and our barrels are already pre-purchased. So the idea to go create this narrative just doesn't really exist within the industry. I kind of like your plan of just ignore it, just let it happen and ignore it. Um, yeah, honestly, we're better off than the government does ignore things. I mean, that's how, I mean, if you look at every major technology innovation and, whether you're into crypto or not, I'm, I'm not a crypto person, but one of the reasons that crypto has thrived, and we've had some really bad actors and bad things that have happened in that world, but one of the reasons it's thrived is the government doesn't know how to regulate. And that's what's allowed it to exist. And a lot of technology innovations throughout history have occurred in the United States specifically because we allow things to actually happen before we regulate them. And we have a system that encourages that kind of innovation versus discourages it like you see in Europe and and many parts of the world is if you make a mistake and break a law that doesn't exist in places in Europe and in Asia, you can lose everything. You can be put in prison, whereas in the United States, for the most part, um, we allow technologies to proliferate. And maybe some could say until it's too late, like you could argue social media hasn't there's parts of social media that has been negative to parts of society. There's there's almost every category of any parts of our economy could argue that there are negative effects to these things. But largely, the reason we're such a successful economy is because we allow these things to, to exist and the government ignores them. And that's awesome. Long government ignoring things. We'll put it in that category. Keep them out of our lives, man. So. <laughs> All right. Last question. And then we're going to switch topics. Uh, And this was kind of the one you talked about a lot of bankruptcies that have happened over the last year, but maybe the biggest was yellow. They, they had 30,000 employees. What happened there? And was that just a tidal wave that they could see in the distance coming? It seemed like it kind of happened overnight, but what happened in that situation? No, this is more like a, uh, a, a small shallow lake that has a very <laughs> small tide that like slowly crawls. It's like a glacier. I mean, this thing should have been dead 15 years ago. So like, if you go back to the history of Yellow, this was a, a 30,000 truck operator, fifth largest LTL company in America. Um, it, it is a large trucking operator and it has about, about 9% market share of the, of the uh, LTL trucking business. So it's, it was a significant player, but its problem was actually its death, if you will, its inevitability was cast in the mid 2000s. Essentially, Bill Dollars, the, the CEO at the time, decided that he wanted to consolidate all of the major unionized LTL providers. So he went out and merged all of the union LTL providers into this big mega company called Yellow Roadway. And um, it nearly filed bankruptcy, I think, four times before it did. First time being during the great financial crisis because they acquired so much debt uh, to acquire these companies. They would not streamline the operations. They ran them as separate entities. So you have these three companies that had come together, but they were run completely separate with no really economies of scale out of that. They had the unions would not let them restructure their contracts to bring consolidation. And so it got bailed out again by uh, the Trump administration. a lot of questions about whether this was a legit, like, should it have been built out? I think you could argue no, but for some, the way thing about, regardless of where you sit on the aisle, if you know somebody in Washington and they care about you politically, that's one of the great things about our system or one of the detriments of our system is that you can get special privileges by doing so. And at the time when the federal government was giving out a lot of money, Gallo applied for a loan uh, based on the fact that it considered itself and we, the Department of Defense considered it a critical operation that national security depended on. It was a joke. No one with a straight face could actually say that was the case. Like the market could have reset. But someone had favor in Washington and was able to get this loan. And so the U.S. Treasury lent Yalo $700 million to help it really survive. 
Uh, and the problem is it burned through all that money and it was looking at a liquidity crisis earlier this year and finally it got put out of its misery. So the crazy part about this is it had about a billion and a half dollars of debt. Um, and we did a, an analysis back in July before it filed bankruptcy about whether it was better off dead or alive in terms of value. So yesterday they liquidated uh, about 70% of their real estate and they recovered $1.88 billion just in that. So what's going to happen out of this is that um, there will be about a billion to a billion and a half dollar surplus in liquidation above the debt. And so even so there will be money left over for folks that bought the stock uh, when it was going under. And there were some hedge funds that actually took large positions on the stock. And so it was this weird deal. As it was filing bankruptcy, the stock was rallying like a thousand percent. This and people are like, "Oh, this is like GameStop." It's like, no. There's someone who understands the balance sheet of the company and realizes that it's real estate. They had owned some of these industrial locations for seventy years, like pre zoning in Los Angeles and stuff, where some of their locations were worth hundreds of millions of dollars in itself. You can't get you know this better than anybody. It's very difficult to get industrial zoning in major U.S. metros, particularly in uh, places like California and New York that are sort of anti-industry. And um, they happen to have some of that that all predated it. So they benefited greatly from um, from just their age. And so now in liquidation, it's, it's, uh, it's going to do better than it did before. So that would have been a Warren Buffett cigar butt opportunity or a cigarette butt, whatever he called it. Yeah, I don't. One I don't know if it's puff. the Warren Buffett play because it's not anymore. You're talking about a well, yes, from from the early years days. Ago, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like 70, like in his earliest days, yes, absolutely. Uh, in his sort of Gen One pre Charlie Munger days, yes, that's the Warren Buffett play. This is more of a uh, Soros, Carlisle, like KKR kind of Citadel kind of like restructuring where it's more um, barbarians at the gate that are just trying to liquidate the business. All right. We're swip- switching topics. We're totally switching to media. You uh, call yourself or the, or the website, or I can't remember where I found it, but freight affiliated media. And I'm going to ask you a bunch about your media strategy because I find it absolutely fascinating. But I'll start with the most simple question. What is your strategy? For... for- well, look, I have a playbook, um, which is, and I learned it. I'm not a media guy. Like, you asked me 10 years ago if I'd be in media, I would have laughed you out of a room because, like, I'm like, why would I do, like, I had never published anything in my life. I never had any experience running media companies. And it just wasn't something that was on my list of things to go do. But what I learned but in building Freightways, which accidentally got into media, it wasn't like we set out to be a media company. We set out to be a data company. Um and provide data and information to companies. And I read, a friend of mine gave me Bloomberg's biography, Bloomberg by Bloomberg, I read it and I was like, this is the playbook for our business, which is effectively, we have this media business which provides top of funnel to our data business. Uh, So our data business is called Sonar, our media business is Freightways.com and Freightways Media. And by basically having this large media business that shapes the way people think about topics and influences the way that they think about things, we can influence their buying behavior. We can influence how they think about product. And we learned that we could use our own media business to to sell our product, our data product, in a very effective and efficient way. And so it worked. And as a side hustle, I decided to go buy a, a pilot and decided by Flying Magazine as a really a side hustle hobby and it's completely separate from Freightwaves. Uh, I went to my board and they're like, no, this doesn't really fit the Freightways business, but you can go do it if you want. And uh, they let me do it. And I started to try the same playbook, which is, hey, I have this media audience. Can I sell them things that they may want? And we started doing real estate. Uh, so we bought 1,500 acres in East Tennessee. Uh, we paid 2,400 an acre and we're now selling lots at 600,000 an acre. It's connected to a fly-in luxury resort in Tennessee that we're going to build. We haven't started construction, but we've sold about $15 million, pre-sold $15 million of real estate through that asset. And then we bought two e-commerce companies. Um, we've seen 
like 700% growth in e-commerce. Uh, like once you own the audience, once you're not renting an audience through Facebook or Google or whatever, and you own it, you can effectively drive very efficient commerce. And so one of the things that we've been doing, and like our business was, when I bought Flying, it was a two and a half million dollar business, it was real small. It's on a run rate of about 40 million today. Um, and that's without real estate, that's strictly the media side. Um, and what I think is really powerful about it is the fact that you have this very efficient funnel because you own the audience, you're not renting it. I think a lot of the problem, if you go look at a lot of the venture back uh, DTC e-commerce companies, and really most venture back companies, you know, the, the running joke in Silicon Valley is that the, the, the venture capitalists work for two parties. They work for the media platforms, so, uh, Facebook and Google, and they work for the real estate San Francisco real estate uh, uh, lenders. That's probably not true anymore, but it's still true that as a venture-backed company, you are effectively paying Google and Facebook to acquire your audiences. And I think that's a... So you're renting an audience. You don't own an audience. And one of the things that I discovered, and it's really a great arbitrage at the end of the day, is that you can... You can build an audience organically like we did at Freightways, which, you know, we're probably 85% of supply chain traffic. We're the world's most respected authority in supply chain news and topics uh, and data. And, and we've built this sort of really powerful uh, uh, business by shaping the way people think about these topics. But I also learned that you can do it with any kind of media. And I'm doing that with flying which we've now bought a big, we're now the largest publisher in aviation. Uh, we also just recently did an acquisition in the Marine, Recreational Marine, which is boating, yachting, sailing, and fishing. So we're now the largest publisher in those categories too. And what I think is really powerful about it is that you, you're able to shape the way people think about these topics and you can drive commerce. So think about the things that pilots care about. You know, we've talked about real estate, they need hangar space, they need places to park their airplanes, but they also need finance. And so we bought about eight different marketplaces that sell used aircraft, consolidated them in, and essentially building the car gurus, for lack of a better term, of aircraft sales. Well, out of that, when people are buying an aircraft, they, they want pricing intelligence. They want to know what it's going for. That's one thing. They also want to finance the aircraft. They want to insure it. They, they want to have free inspections. And so by owning the media business and shaping the way people think about things, you effectively are able to create your own sort of wall garden uh, when somebody's interested in a topic. And so that's the business model that I have discovered is this really interesting arbitrage in content that drives commerce by using the, um, by using the content that we create to drive outcomes. And it, you know, Google and Facebook have really changed the way media works and have made that model largely unprofitable for a lot of uh, publishers, made it very difficult. And I'm super excited that they have because what that means is I can buy these assets for a fraction of what they're worth, finance it through the cash flow in the media business. But I actually, what I'm really buying is the audience. And from those audiences, I can find other products and services to sell that community. That's my model. That's the playbook. If you're wondering and you're listening to this and you're wondering, am I an entrepreneur? Here's one way to think about it. Do you ever just wake up and go, I'm going to buy a magazine as a side hobby and then turn it into an absolute empire? And if that is not going through your head, um, re- it's just actually anybody could do this. This is like, it's not that hard. And like you're talking about buying a business at two to five times EBITDA. Okay. Are these things cash? How do you, yes. How do you value a media business? Two to five times EBITDA. That's my rule. I follow. I mean, go listen. to Okay, what's go, two and what's five? What does a two look like and what does a five look like? I mean, it's subjective, but let's just sort of speak frank with it. Um, I mean, it's largely subjective, but you're talking about on the higher end on a five, you're talking about a high quality, profitable brand that that has stability. Um, you're looking for a stable audience. You're looking for a high quality asset that's in the sort of upper end of it. So. When we bought the Marine portfolio, um, that would be a considered a really high end brand. It was the largest, you know, boating magazine, yachting magazine, and sailing world are, are, are brands that have been around for 100 years. And they're highly, highly regarded. When I bought Flying, I paid five times. You know, it was a ha- generated half a million dollars of EBITDA. I paid two and a half 
times in uh, two and a half million. So like it's subjective, but the higher quality businesses are trading at five times. The the lower quality businesses trade lower in that in that threshold. And so um, but it's it's subjective. It's <laughs> I believe that I can sell so I mean ultimately when I'm looking at these businesses, I'm looking, yes, I'm looking at the financials, but I'm then I'm asking myself, what can I sell these people? Like, like, can I do I understand the market well enough? Like I I've never spent any time in the marine industry, but I, I grew up around boats and I understand enough about that audience to know what types of products. It's very similar to the aviation audience. When you're buying a boat, you got to finance it. When you're buying a boat, you, you know, boaters are very enthusiastically committed to their boating hobby. If they're into fishing, they're diehard, you know, more people fish than golf. Like twice as many people fish than golf each year. And it cuts across all socio demographics. I mean, you have, People who are who, who barely can 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 make it that are fishing, you know, and maybe for them it's dinner. And then you have super high billionaires that are you know have the the greatest fishing yacht you can get doing offshore fishing, but they're all doing the activity. And I I think that's what makes these things really interesting is that you you have audience that really want something and care about their industry. So when I look at it, I'm asking myself, do I think I have something that this audience will buy? that I can go acquire or build that I can serve this audience that is not dependent upon media monetization. Now, ultimately, it's dependent upon me driving success in the media business. But if I do that successfully and I'm able to create growth in media, then I can take all of that capital and deploy it back into growing the audience, which then I can go monetize through some other mechanism. Okay. And, and okay, so two to five times you, uh, you go buy Flying Magazine, which I'm assuming I, uh, I'm sorry to say I haven't actually, uh, read it yet, but I will one day. If this podcast is successful enough, I'm going to be an avid sub- subscriber. Uh, <laughs> You'll be a subscriber. <laughs> um, by the way, we're giving away an airplane. Okay. We're giving away an airplane for subscribers. Well, perfect. I mean, I'll, Johnny, uh, sign, anybody Johnny sign me up right now. And win an icon airplane. So. But you say I'm going to pay you two and a half million for for the magazine, which I'm assuming was a hard copy and a digital copy. Yeah, they had a digital website and a a, a physical magazine. And then you said I need to look at your uh, your proto or your uh, your the profile of your customer, which are probably uh, you know very affluent folks interested in aviation. Yeah. I mean. I, like essentially a media kits. I mean, media companies pretty much should know their audience and you can make some, like, I've done this long enough to know. And I think most people who, I think anyone who sort of studies media or audiences could figure out like who the audience is. And if you don't know it, and say you're looking at an asset that you're trying to acquire and you don't know much about the audience, media companies, anyone that's been around should be able to tell you who their audience is. I mean, if they don't know it and you don't know it, then you probably shouldn't be this is not the right business for you if you can't figure out who the audience is based on the profile of the content. But anyways, you're essentially underwriting the audience. And from that, you're making decisions well, what products do these, this, does this community need? I mean, if you think about aviation, these are typically high net worth, uh, have disposable. I mean, aviation is a, an expensive hobby or it's a lucrative career. Either one of those two things, that's our audience. If it's a if it's an expensive hobby, that means they have a lot of disposable income to stay in the air because if they don't spend the money, they're not going to be in the air very long. And if if it's a career for them, then they're doing well. And uh, our goal is to find services to to provide that audience. All right. So you buy the deal. You buy Flying Magazine. What acts, and then you say, okay, these people need to finance uh, these airplanes. Is your goal to go buy a financing, a, an aircraft finance business, or are you just going to spin up one from scratch? And is the media business always stay separate, just driving traffic to all these different entities, or are you growing it all as kind of one vertical organization? I don't know if that's too nuanced of a question. They're actually separate companies. Okay. Because eventually you'll get to the point where you'll want, you have a separate management team. So our finance business, we have a separate management team that runs the finance business. It has its own P&L, its own incorporation, because at some point we hope that it becomes a $100 million business and it can essentially be spun off and 
sold or taken public at some point. Like it can be big enough to be on its own. And look, the truth is that FreightWaves, our data business is now big enough where it doesn't need FreightWaves Media to serve as its media arm. It actually is the big is big enough to where it could be sold or spun off completely and separated as its own entity. So we try to create separate entrepreneurial management teams that can go drive success. Uh, when it came to buying the finance business, it's always opportunistic when I buy things. Like I've been an entrepreneur, been a founder. Like I cold started freight waves. I raised outside venture capital. Starting businesses is a very long journey. Yes, I'm entrepreneurial, but I actually like to get a head start. So one of the things that I have done is um, when we bought the finance business, we I found it on a deal listing site, frankly. Like, I know the stuff that I want to go do. Like, these are the categories I would love to go do. I could certainly go cold start them, but cold starting is a, there's a lot of work involved in that. Um, but we happened to find this uh, uh, financing, aircraft financing business uh, uh, on a deal listing website, on a business listing website. And the founder, and I see this a lot in aviation where, someone is a pilot or likes airplanes and starts a business to serve it. And for whatever reason, that business doesn't scale. Maybe the founder doesn't know how to do that. Maybe there's some, some just something holding back real growth from it. And so we can buy these things pretty cheaply. And from that, we can then go out and scale them up because we know how to do that. On those businesses, you're paying a couple of times as well. And you said like a good business versus a bad business. You don't mind, and not, maybe not a bad business, maybe just not as mature of a business. You have no problem buying something for two times EBITDA, putting it uh, some people on it that can kind of clean it up and make it better. You have that play. I'm a founder. Like I like problems. Like I do not like successful businesses because, like successful businesses that you pay premium dollars for is not my like as a founder entrepreneur, which is really what I am at the end of the day. I'm not a an m a guy, I'm an entrepreneur, I want to find something cheap enough that I can go fix. And now it could be that I'm paying a premium for that business, but there's something about it that I can go fix. And one of the things I get excited about is when I find problems in a business. Because I, I, when, I, when I go through due diligence, I'm like, I remember when we looked at the Marine portfolio uh, and we're paying, a, you know, we're paying 5X on this business. And this is a very large business, largest acquisition we've ever done. And I remember going through diligence and thinking, I hope they haven't fixed these problems. Like I bought this business, I bought flying from them previously. So I was, I knew potentially where all the issues were going to be on the Marine side. The Marine side was 10 times the size of flying. So this is a bigger, much bigger business and a much bigger check. And I'm thinking, I hope they hadn't fixed the problems. Cause if I, if, if the business is doing this well now, and it had all the problems that flying had. I know exactly where all the bodies are buried. I can go fix these things. I hope they haven't fixed these things. And sure enough, they hadn't fixed the name <laughs> one of them. And like, and management, if management were here right in front of me, they know, like I told them this, like, I'm so happy that you guys didn't fix this stuff because I know I'm instantly where to get additional growth and additional cost synergies. And so for me, I, it's, it's, it's about whether or not you want to do the work. I like being a founder. Like Freightways is a very successful business. And I could sit and do, and that is a, enough to keep someone busy. And it's a super successful business that uh, the, the, the data business at some point will sell and it will be a very big upside for our venture capital investors because it's it just is a very successful business. That is boring to me. Not that I hate Freightways or I hate the data business, but the fact that it is much more about growing the existing business and adding products that we're going to launch in three months or six months is hard for a founder entrepreneur type to get overly excited. Like I have done, I've hired management. I have great management team at Freight Waves uh, on the data side that are running the day to days of that business. And it, it is so awesome that I don't have to do the work that they're doing because I'm not cut out to do it. I wouldn't be good at it anyways. A professional management. But what I like is taking a problem. The thing about buying a business at any level is you're essentially optimizing that business. You're either fixing problems that the previous administration didn't fix, you're making investments they didn't make, um, but you have this opportunity to, to build something out of it. And so I like businesses that have strong audiences and strong audience characteristics and media. Uh, and then I, I have a playbook to go fix those things and grow them. And look, it's not to say that the media is a throwaway product. 
because I, I care deeply about growing these media businesses and making profit, making them profitable. And I, you know, our model is basically buy them, get in, uh, double them in size. And then I'm talking media specific, not, not the adjacent business. Double the media business within two years, get it to about a 50% margin is the goal. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially then we go find adjacent products. And what we found with flying, so we, we bought Flying Magazine and we've done 20, we've bought another 25 uh, aviation brands after that. Um, small, these are typically media businesses can be small. It could be a single website or a small magazine. But what we found is, and this has been the surprising thing that I've learned is, you think it starts to dilute the audience. You think that the more properties you get, you buy, you're starting to pull from the same audience or even advertisers. That is actually the opposite of what we found. Is it's actually easier to bundle things together and you actually accelerate by cross-selling into the audiences that you already own. So these things have been, have been have worked out well. So owning more of a category for us is more important. And one of the things that we get asked is like, are, like advertisers, like, are you going to raise the price in the advertising? And I'm like, no, actually, I want you to spend more. And how do we incite you to spend more? So. And you might say, Chris, shut up. You're asking way too many questions. No, but no, but so I great. might ask, how would you double the size of a media company that's been around for 50 years already? What might be something that you do? A lot of, a lot of times, if you're talking print, a lot of times the companies have, have, have as print. If you think about the print business model, 20 years ago, print magazines were like the most lucrative business you could own. If you owned a core brand in print magazines, it was like owning a, it was like owning a, a really sexy piece of real estate because, and newspapers were this way as well. The internet completely destroyed that model. But what happened is the publishers ended up in a, in a fight to, sit, to, to be profitable rather than investing in the print magazine. They didn't really have the DNA to go into digital, so they didn't make the right kinds of investments in digital. But what they did was they started to really lower the quality of the magazine. They deteriorated the paper stock, all of this stuff. And their whole supply chain is messed up anyways. I mean, selling through newsstands is a, is a farce because essentially they don't keep any of the profits. You know, we, I looked at, a, at an Amazon contract and you know, 85% of the profits went to Amazon, revenue went to Amazon. Like I have all the cost to fulfill it. You get 85% of the revenue. What the hell is that? And you won't share the data with me. Like, what is that? That's nonsense. So <laughs> essentially when we, we look at this business, we say there's a lot of problems. So let's go fix the core problems. Let's, you know, if flying, we invested in print. Like we actually doubled the cost per issue or per uh, copy. Like we went to a super high end print. And we got rid of a lot of the junk advertising. I fired 80% of the advertisers in the back of the book. Like I did some pretty reckless things on the face of it because I wanted to create something that I thought would have lasting value. So you're going to have to spend, for us, you'll spend probably six months with negative, you'll, you'll actually deteriorate the business for a period of time as you fix it. And then that's when the magic starts to take place. Because once the audience believes that you're making investments in them, and you care about them and not your advertisers, but you care about the experience they have with it, particularly if it's a legacy audience that's been connected to this vehicle for 20, 30, 50, 100 years, they get super stoked. And that's when you start to see the returns because they start to, to pay, you know, we took the subscription price on average from $8 a year flying to $40. And every what was crazy looking at the data, every single month, that the prior owner, every single month in the history of the data, and I have it back to 2006, and I actually gone through three different owners, they had lost money on subscriptions every single month. In other words, what they generated in subscription price versus what it cost to print and fulfill it was a loss. So every subscriber they added hurt their business. Like unit economics 101 is just nuts. So I said, screw that. I'm not, I will not print another issue, another copy that I'm going to lose money on. We, we made sure that we had a profit in that. We do. Uh, and then we go heavy into investing in digital uh, experiences, which is we want a lot of content. We want to create, we want people when they think about aviation to come to our sites uh, and, and learn about it, be inspired about it, uh, just be connected to, their, to their, their passion for aviation. And from that, we can monetize. If I, if I have a connected, engaged audience, I can figure out how to monetize it. 
And monetization can come through affiliate links. A lot of these publishers don't do anything in affili- affiliate. So they can tell you to go, they have the, like, we, we do all these gear reviews, but we don't put a link with an Amazon link at the bottom to help you buy it. Like, why don't they do that? And like, they just don't. They, they like, haven't built that infrastructure. And so there's all these little things that are so obvious when you own them that you can go fix. Um, and that's the easy stuff to fix. That's the stuff I like finding that somebody has gotten wrong that hadn't fixed that because I can go fix that instantly and get some instant, you know, within a first year, you know, year and a half, get some wins. And then it's a mat. The hard stuff is when you really have to sort of like make bigger speculative bets on new product. That's when it gets harder. And real quick, and it might just be like a function of time and just playbook, but you said, I want to 2X the media business before I start going after the adjacent businesses. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not that I want to 2X the media business before. It's I'm going to get the media business. I'm going to double the size of the media business. And th- at the same time, I'm figuring out what to commercialize. So I think of myself as like a almost I have a private equity playbook with an entrepreneur's mind, which is like a super rare thing because most private equity guys are they're spreadsheet jockeys. They don't actually know how to to do the whole like venture startup thing. Um, but that's my strategy is we use an underwriting model. I'm a, I'm a spreadsheet jockey by all definitions. It's what most people here think of me. But like, like, that's what we do. We underwrite the business the way a private equity firm would do it. And then we make all of the execution playbook the way an entrepreneur would do. Damn. Another wall to go run through. It's the, but the great thing, Chris, is this is available to anybody. Like, like this is not a secret playbook. Like, like it's so simple. Go find a hobby or something that you love or an industry that you care deeply about. Go find the number one, number two, number three media property in that space. Go buy it if you, you can buy it. You can, go, you can go down market if you have to. Go buy it. And then you operate the media business the way you would a normal business. Pay attention to the unit economics. Get the right kind of people that can contribute content. Execute that. And then go figure out what does my audience need and care about. And it doesn't have to be finance. Doesn't have to be insurance or real estate. It could be some e-commerce play. Like there's so many things that you can do, but you don't have to have this really sophisticated. You know, you have to have a lot of capital to do. Would you pass on something like golf because it's such a big industry with so many dominant media platforms that you like? If I said you had to get in golf, what would be your way to get into golf? I would go find the uh, uh, probably a formerly loved brand that have fallen on hard times that everybody in the industry is like, oh, that thing's going under, it's in bad shape. So take Sports Illustrated, it's a great example of this. Like the best play I could make right now if I had unlimited resources would be to go buy, so Sports Illustrated was sold to Anthem Group. Um, and it's it's like, they, they're they using AI people to write sports content. It's like, it's really it's a really sort of funny story because these AI generators they're getting rid of editorial people and they're using AI to generate. Uh, there's this story about volleyball. Volleyball can be a difficult sport, especially if you don't have a ball. It's like one of the articles that came out of AI and they published this stuff. But like I would go buy Sports Illustrated and then I would find uh, products and services that the sports audience cares about. Like it could be merch. It could be ga- you know gambling. Like, you could do a lot of stuff around that audience. And I think that's just an interesting deal. But if I, if I had golf, I'm not a golfer, so I, I don't know enough, enough about the golf names. But like I would go, let's say that you could buy Golf Journal, which is actually a really well-ran publication with a very fanatical audience. So I wouldn't suggest that's a distressed asset by any stretch. But I would buy Golf Journal or I would go buy Golf Digest. Um, I don't know any of the metrics of these businesses. Um, and that would be my audience. Like you're a golf, right? Yeah. Assume, right? And, and the reason I picked golf was because it's such a big industry with so much content and media already in it. That I didn't know well, if there was the, a play in what it. Is the, what is the, what is a ma- magazine in the golf industry? Like I said, I know very little Go- about golf. Golf Digest, Golf, uh, those are probably two of the largest. I mean, Golf Digest, you can go to any airport in the world. I mean, any newsstand in the world that's carrying sports. Has so those a- would be my top two. I go to the top and go work my way down. And then I'll find like Golf Digest or Fort Worth. And that's who I would buy a- a- after I had gone through the list. Um but essentially, you're buying, you know, the great thing about the great thing about golf that as a media executive, I'd argue is 
you probably have a lot of businesses where somebody who was a golfer, loved golf, decided to create a business out of it and wasn't a very good business person. They may have been a scratch golfer and a crappy business person. And that honestly is a great thing for my model because you may be able to pick up some really good businesses, like good products that are sort of built by a, a really uh, emphatic founder who was really meticulous about the, the product who couldn't figure out how to monetize it. And that would be the perfect kind of combination because you can pick these things up pretty cheap. And then it's a matter of scale and you own the media brand. Like you're influencing, if you own Golf Digest and, and, and married it up with like some golf app that's like a really good app that nobody knows about, or perhaps it's a, I don't know, a, a, a club manufacturer or something that, that nobody knows about, it's sort of like an obscure club manufacturer or whatever, you could, you could make a lot of money that way. I mean, the whole, the whole thing is this audience, right? Like you're buying the audience, that is your asset, and you finance it through media Really, your your media cash. I freaking love it. the the two The two brands that I joke about wanting to buy they're nostalgic from when we were kids. Remember, no fear. Yeah, no fear shirts. <laughs> and then remember, like golf is life. The rest is just details. Or it'd be like flying is life. The rest is just details. I mean, these shirts were everywhere. I wonder. No fear clearly has a nostalgic audience. It doesn't have like as uh, maybe as obvious of an adjacent businesses like. But what is no fit? Was it like off roading or something? Yeah, it was just like shirts that like teenagers wore, and it would say like it would just say it have some quote, and then it was just promoting like don't have fear, and especially in today's world where everybody's scared of everything, especially our younger generations because they've grown up listening to a media that's basically like the world is ending, I think No Fear would actually play pretty well. I don't know who owns the brand. If you're listening to this... It probably was a Sears brand. <laughs> We're going to be really disappointed to find out that Sears Roebuck like, created this brand. I'm like, oh, that isn't so cool. All right. I just wanted to ask you one more thing. I don't have kids your age yet, but I thought this was something really cool that you did, and we'll bring it home on this. You said that you bought an e-commerce business with your son. How old's your son? So he's uh, 17. Okay, just the quick, how did this happen, the story, and we'll bring it home. So my son was lifeguarding at the pool and making 12 bucks an hour and spent the whole summer doing it and came to me at the end of the summer and said, hey, dad, I, I'm tired of working for a, like, you don't make a lot of money, right? 12 bucks an hour is a lot of hard days, you know, even though he's lifeguarding, that isn't great pay. And he's like, I want to make real money. And he's like, how do I start a business? So he, he sort of... He came to me wanting to start a business and we did some stuff that wasn't real successful, but it was a chance for him to understand it. And I was going through, and I do this on the weekends is I'll scout these listing sites, these business listing sites. I'm actually looking for stuff for flying. And I came across a really tiny e-commerce site called Aeroswag that happened to sell custom products to pilots. And I was like, hey, I would buy that for flying, but I will buy it so that he and I can learn it. So it was $10,000. Uh, the company had done $6,000. And this is a perfect example of a successful product, print-on-demand product, uh, founder who's a pilot, loved aviation, but for whatever reason had not scaled the business and monetized it. And I was like, I could, I could do this because I could take my audience, my playbook, and apply it into this e-commerce business. And I'll do it alongside my son. He'll help me build this business. And that's exactly what we've done. And so we've seen... You know, that business will do uh, over $100,000 this year. We bought it in January. It'll do $100,000. It will, it's a 25% margin business. So it will generate, you know, twenty five dollars to $30,000 of, of contribution mar- or profit, if you will. And he gets a front row seat of seeing how business is really done. And yes, is it in some ways, because I own a media business, is it sort of cheating? Absolutely. But that's what business is all about. It's about having networks and distribution. He's learning the power of what it means to own an audience, how to distribute product to them, how to design product, how to price product, how to think about customer acquisition, how to think about lifetime value, how to map, like all the stuff you would learn by doing it, he gets to see it firsthand and he gets to have some ownership in the outcome. And so it's been a great little experience and uh, we've, we've, you know, been, been driving it. So, okay. So like, what is one thing that he, or a few things, like what's his job? What would you kind of know the playbook, but what does he do? Yeah. I mean, product, product pricing. So he's the one designing a lot of the images and the product, um, you know, uh, how we market the product, 
the actual products themselves. He's, he's learned that he's got a little bit of uh, sort of creative, uh, being able to, to design the entire product. So he runs the product designs, uh, designs these things out, uh, figures out how to price them, figures out how to market them, runs marketing campaigns. Uh, the great thing about print on demand, I mean, you think about as a sort of taking this as a, a broader sort of conversation towards how easy it is to start a business in America. Shopify creates, so this is a Shopify built store which anybody can go create and they're handling, you know, the payments, they're handling the, the website, they're handling all of that. Super turnkey. You get a print on demand. We use a, a service called Printful that does print on demand swag. So like this hat and, and I, I have one of our cases I'm showing you here. It's a print on demand iPhone case with an airplane map. It's great because it's all super turnkey. So now what he gets to figure out is, okay, what products do I want to offer? What designs do I want to offer this audience? What do I want to charge the audience? How do I want to distribute it and market it? And those are the things that, that he gets to help experiment. And he's done some things innovative that I haven't explored around TikTok and stuff. He's using AI to, to write. So one of the things he was doing was using ChatGPT to, to write the checkout, like the descriptions of the products. Um, but he's uh, he's doing the stuff that if it were his only business, he'd be doing the same thing. So, um, but it's 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 such a cool experience because he gets a firsthand account at the power of audience. Now, what he'll tell me is, at some point he wants to he wants to run my playbook on his own business without me involved, and that's awesome. And that's what I want him to do. And so, hopefully, so, at some point he'll figure out what he really loves. His passion is not airplanes; it's mine. But at some point, he'll be able to take this playbook and apply it to any kind of industry. Maybe it's golf. He's not a golfer, but he's into rock climbing. So maybe that's what he ends up doing. And he can take the same playbook and apply it there. And he's off to the races. Craig, thank you for round two. Today was awesome. Chris, appreciate it, man. Uh, Thanks for having me.